Pints with Jack, Season 4, Episode 73. The Great Divorce with Risking Enchantment. Hey everyone, it's David here. One of my favourite podcasts is the Risking Enchantment podcast. They talk about faith and literature and it's just wonderful. Quite a few months ago, they did an episode where they spoke about Till We Have Faces. And so I sent them an email saying how much I enjoyed it. And we got to talking and they then invited me onto their show to talk about Lewis's best book, The Great Divorce. And so what you're about to hear is that discussion. Enjoy. Welcome to Risking Enchantment, a podcast about art, beauty and the Catholic faith. Hosted by Rachel Sherlock. Hello and welcome to Risking Enchantment. For this week's episode, you have Phoebe Watson as usual, but joining us this week is David Bates from the Pints with Jack podcast. Thanks so much for coming on the show with us. You're very welcome. It's it's really nice when you get invited on a podcast that you listen to. Uh, yeah, I, it's always so strange. I was just listening to you. We were getting ready for this episode, so I was listening to your respective episodes on the book that we're going to be discussing. So I've been listening to you all week, and now I'm and now I'm seeing you face to face, and it's a very different experience. It's like, oh, I have to remember to actually reply when he says. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my questions are no longer simply rhetorical. Uh, I, I did want to give a shout out to Grace, who is my wife's co-host, who put me onto your podcast in the first place. Uh, thanks, Grace. And she's reached out to us on social media before, and she's just wonderful. But maybe you want to tell us about Pints with Jack first. Sure, sure. Uh, so I was introduced to Narnia at a very young age. It is literally the earliest memory of any book being read to me. And I was a huge fan. I went to see it at the theatre, all the things. And I then rediscovered Narnia in my 20s. And about that time, my faith was coming back alive. And I had people around me that said, oh, you know, Lewis wrote other stuff as well. And so that's when I started digging into mere Christianity, the screw tape letters, the problem of pain. And uh, for a while, I had been saying, I really should start a C.S. Lewis book club because I've always enjoyed his books. And I feel I would get so much more out of them if I could talk about them with somebody. And then I met a guy called Matt at a party and we started talking about C.S. Lewis, which, as I'm sure you know, this is what you do at parties. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and and I said, well, even if it's just the two of us, that would make a great book club if we get a coffee, get a beer, and we'll just work our way through. Let's go through mere Christianity. And so we just announced it on Facebook, and then other people started joining us. But we then started having people from outside of San Diego, because that's where I live, outside of San Diego saying, can you Skype us in or do something like that? And that seemed like a logistical nightmare. But after we had been doing the book club for uh, a couple of sessions, I was sad that we, we were going through it all so quickly. We were going through mere Christianity in a month. That's not enough time. And so I suggested, let's start a podcast. We can go through it chapter by chapter, and we can then also share the audio on the podcast, and then people outside of our city can listen to us as well, and we can have a big virtual book club. And so that's what we started doing. We initially called it The Eagle and Child, after the pub where Lewis would meet with the Inklings. Uh, but when we came to try and get a domain name, we ended up changing the name to Pints with Jack because Lewis's nickname was Jack. That's what his friends would call him. And we've gone through Mere Christianity, The Great Divorce, Till We Have Faces, and we're just wrapping up the screw tape letters right now. That's great. I think we often find that when we're planning up a, a podcast, which is that despite the fact that our podcasts often run pretty long, like over an hour, it still feels like a really short time to cover a whole book. And especially something like Lewis, the fact that you can actually just sit with each chapter and take a bit of time to think about it. I mean, it just speaks to how great he is as an author, but it's really worth it. So I, I, I think it's just nice to take a slightly slower pace over these things and get to sit with a particular book for a while. But we're not going to do that tonight. We're going to plow through a whole book in an evening. <laughs> We picked out The Great Divorce. I think we all share a feeling that The Great Divorce might be our favourite Lewis work. It Mine's not even a feeling. I am absolutely adamant. I think this is Lewis's best work. And I fight often with one of our co-hosts, Andrew. He's an Episcopalian seminarian. And he, he likes to quote Lewis, who says that Till We Have Faces is far and away my best book. And all respect to Lewis, I disagree. I think in The Great Divorce, you, you have a crystallization of so many things that you find in his other works, 
like like the screw tape letters, like Mere Christianity, all of these ideas brought together and portrayed in a wonderful fantasy to give you really clear images, to really engage your imagination as your mind is processing the ideas that's that are that are behind them. Yeah. And I think it's a lot more accessible than Till We Have Faces. Like I think when we did Till We Have Faces on the podcast, it was it was really fascinating to to look into it and delve into it. But it's one of the few C.S. Lewis books that kind of left a bad aftertaste in my mouth. It just isn't uplifting in the way that so much of Lewis's work actually is. Yeah, you have to really delve into it to get the uplifting, meaningful bit of it. Whereas I think The Great Divorce, you can give to anyone and they'll get something out of it Mm -hmm. and come away interested by it. Andrew says that after people have read Till We Have Faces for the first time, they get Till We Have Faces whiplash. The, what the heck did I just read? <laughs> I remember that face on her when she first read it. It oh, was not pretty. It's not good. The o- My only criticism for The Great Divorce, well, there's like a few little things. First you of all, a criticism of I, The Great Divorce? I do. First of all, the name, which is a reference to William Blake's poem, mm-hmm. Marriage of Heaven and Hell. And it's a very clever name, which is about the divorce of heaven and hell and how those two things aren't in a marriage together. But the great divorce has definitely lasted in a way that the the marriage of heaven and hell hasn't. So the the name itself just kind of, when people hear you talking about it, it doesn't really, it has a sort of strange connotation for them. Absolutely. And I think generally, Lewis is an amazing imaginative writer, but his titles for his books are often not very good. And particularly when you dig into the Narnian books and hear the titles he was originally suggesting, it's like, you're not good at this. <laughs> I think the, the closest comparison I have is that I often tell people that my favorite Chesterton book is The Club of Queer Trades, which in 2020 gives like a stony faced silence of what on earth is that going to be about? But uh, I think the other thing that is interesting with The Great Divorce is that it's an amazing story, but it's really hard to sum up or to give like a two sentence introduction when you're trying to like press a book into someone's hands. The copy we have, which we get to buy because our, our own copy is lent out at the moment, has a bus in the front. But more egregious than the bus is there's this like little one sentence description at the top that says, the timeless novel about a bus ride from hell to heaven, which I I feel like needs a little like electric guitar lick. Like it, <laughs> it just so doesn't convey what the book is like at all. You just think that this is going to be some flaming bus ride for the whole book. <laughs> it's not really like that at all. No, the bus ride itself is a chapter, mm-hmm. if that. And most of it is spent talking about the place that they've left. And the place that and then and then the description of the, the place that they've arrived at. Yeah. <laughs> so now that I've established that it's probably a difficult job to sum up this book, David, do you wanna have a go? <laughs> sure, sure. I, I think before we actually talk about the setup itself, we need to say a word about imaginative supposals. Because Lewis loved these. It's a it's a what if question. And the most famous is the line the witch in the wardrobe. It, it's not a pure allegory in the way that a lot of people think. When Lewis was explaining it, he said, what if Christ created a world like Narnia and chose to be incarnated and to die and rise again in that world? What would that look like? And the great divorce is, 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 is a similar kind of supposal, but here he's asking a different question. He's saying, what would it be like if souls in hell could actually visit heaven? And what if they could actually remain there? would they actually even want to do that? So this is the question that he's asking, and he's, he's, he's telling it through this story. And then getting to the plot, it, it all begins with Lewis himself waiting at a bus stop. He's in a sprawling grey town. It's about dusk. And we'll later find out that this grey town is hell, or actually even purgatory, if you choose to leave. The bus turns up and it just looks magnificent in comparison to the rest of this town. And it takes the group of quarreling, petty inhabitants from the town and it takes them to what we will later come to know as heaven, or at least the very foothills of heaven. And they arrive in heaven and it's now early morning. It's just before dawn. It's beautiful. It's full of trees and grass and mountains in the distance. But we very quickly find out that this land is different. It's hard. 
it, it's so much more real than the folks who got on the bus. It actually makes them look like ghosts in comparison. And even when they try and walk on the grass, the grass is as hard as diamonds and it doesn't bend underneath their feet. And then in the last bit of setup, we see these figures come down from the mountains. These are, Lewis calls them bright spirits or solid people. And they're inhabitants of heaven who come to the ghosts. And really the rest of the book is these, these bright spirits, these solid people speaking to the ghosts and trying to convince them to come with them, to journey with them up to the mountains. And really, that's the rest of the book. It, it's it's really similar to the Divine Comedy. It, this is basically Lewis's version of the Divine Comedy, because there, Dante, he takes a tour of hell, heaven, and purgatory. And he has Virgil as his guide. He was a poet that Dante just adored. So he's his guide, and then later, Lady Beatrice. And in The Great Divorce, Lewis does the same thing. He goes to hell, purgatory, and heaven. And as his guide, he has an author who he absolutely adored in real life, George MacDonald. And that's that's really the rest of the book. The rest of the book are these conversations between the ghosts and these solid people. Yeah, I think it's really important to emphasize the dreamlike nature of the book, that it, is, it isn't him laying out his exact theology of what he thinks heaven and hell are, but helping us to come to a better understanding of the choices we face in this life. And it also in some ways it takes that moment of death or that moment of choice because as Christians we believe that the moment of death is the end of your choices that even in purgatory there are no more choices to be made but this kind of takes that moment of death and stretches it out into a story and looks at how all of the choices you have made up to that moment can either lead you to accepting heaven or not. And the the lesson that we really have to learn whenever we read Lewis is do not skip the preface. <laughs> People end up getting some very odd ideas about Lewis because they skip the preface of Surprised by Joy, his spiritual autobiography, and they get some very odd ideas about what he's talking about in The Great Divorce when they skip the preface. Because the number of times I've heard people say, oh, Lewis explains what he thinks the afterlife is like in The Great Divorce. And in the preface, he says, this is not what I'm doing. I'm not suggesting that this is what it's like. I, I'm using this supposal to, to explore an idea. And as you say, it all focuses around this question of choice and the impact of the choices that we make. And also kind of how insane some of our choices are if we actually look at them carefully. They make sense to us in the moment, but how, how many times have you made a decision and thought about it afterwards like, that was really bad. That was pretty stupid. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just thinking what the screw tape letters would be like if you skip the preface on that. Oh, well, when the screw tape letters was actually initially published, it was published in a church newspaper called The Guardian. So this isn't the Guardian newspaper that you have today. So it's in a church newsletter that's distributed. And there was actually at least one person that wrote in and said that they were cancelling their subscription because they thought the advice in these letters, some of it was not only bad, but practically demonic. <laughs> What a compliment. Well, I mean, you can definitely say that Lewis succeeded in what he was trying to do. But yeah, it, it's it's kind of like that moment on social media when one of your friends is sharing an article from The Onion or Babylon Bee or Eye of the Tiber. And it's clear that they actually think that it's true. Yeah, they, they've, missed the, they've missed the big banner at the top that says satire. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think, though, I suppose... To excuse the the mix up that people have is that the afterlife that he creates feels very right. Like he he has created something that isn't just what we've heard a thousand times before. It isn't a hell of fire and it isn't an, a heaven of clouds. It is something different and in its own way very vivid, even in its like dreamlike quality. That it feels that he's really tapping into something that actually feels true when you're reading it. And this is classic Lewis. He said that the mind is the organ of truth, the imagination is the organ of meaning. And I would suggest that I think what makes Lewis such a great writer is he engages the imagination like no other. He, he sketches out enough of an image for our minds to embrace it and to then run with it. Yeah. And I think something that we were discussing about just before this podcast was that 
it opens with a grey town and the grey town just sounds so miserable and so boring and so un, uninteresting to be around. And it, you know, as we said, that that turns out to be either a hell or a kind of purgatorial state. It, it makes me so happy because I'm, I'm sure you've experienced this as well. There's people in my life who are not in their faith or are not interested and they always try to be clever and say something like, oh, well, all the interesting people would be in hell anyway. And you're like, oh, yeah, that's right. You would get hell on your terms. That's That's what you're proposing here. (laughs) And I think that they praise sinners far too greatly. Uh, Lewis himself writes that all of the great tyrants of history, they're all really similar. They're actually really kind of dull. If you you want variety and vivacity, you go and look at the saints. That's where you'll find it. Because what is it that unites the saints? Some were married, some weren't. Some were male, some were female, some were young, some were old, some were healthy, some were sick. The only thing that unites them is the fact that they loved Christ deeply and that they lived lives of courageous virtue. And I think that naturally makes them interesting. Yeah. And I think that's so tied up in what Lewis is really good at, which is making goodness feel like a positive force, like it's something very attractive, very alluring. I think this really comes across in the Narnia stories as well. It's kind of throughout all of his his fiction and, and his nonfiction as well. But just that sense that so often when we see goodness portrayed in media, it feels like an absence of something. They're not being cruel. They're just being kind, which feels like a, a less potent force. And so what Lewis is so good at conveying is that goodness is actually the active thing, the alluring thing, the the more real thing, whereas sin is and is this greyness, this lack of interestingness, this failure to actually live up to the realness of the world. And I think that we are kind of allergic to almost holiness. I think because we see it so often, we have friends that we know who are, they're almost holy. And they're kind of annoying (laughs) in the holiness that they do have. Uh, But I would suggest that it only really takes you knowing a real saint to see what the real thing looks like. And that was definitely true for me. I came back to my faith. I never truly went away, but my faith came alive at university. And it was principally through an Irish missionary named Maeve. And when I phoned my mum to tell her about this talk that I just heard, I described this lady, this, uh, this missionary the sister, as shiny. She was shiny. There there was something that she had that I wanted. And it was something that went above and beyond mere morality or simple observance of ritual. She had a life in her that I I wanted for myself. Yeah. And I think it's so clever how he conveys that in the way that he constructs the landscape. I think you, you made a point to us, which was that he is so good at communicating truth through characters, which is obviously impressive, but is kind of the way that we normally expect to have truth revealed to us in fiction. But he actually manages to do it through landscape, the actual quality of the land itself. You mentioned earlier that it's hard to walk on the grass because it's more real than the ghosts who have come up from from hell. Yeah, and yet it's so beautiful as well that unlike the grey town, which is drizzly and like the worst of a suburb, the illustration of heaven is just somewhere you want to spend so much time and you can also see yourself journeying through that land it makes heaven somewhere where you're really excited to be it's not that you're standing around in a white robe with a halo on you all the time (laughs) it he has made heaven in this book very much he's done for heaven what he did for jesus and god in the lion the witch in the wardrobe aslan is not a tame lion it, 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 it's not it's not just uh, simple niceness. Oh, he's a nice lion. No, he, he, he's not tame. He's good, but you never quite know what's going to happen. And I think it's the same journeying into Lewis's heaven here in The, the Great Divorce. There's a desire to explore, but you're also a little bit scared because you're not quite sure what you're going to encounter. Yeah. And it also really explores the idea that goodness is hard, that you have to learn to like it in a certain way that this is a land that you have to learn to live on. And I think that's the element of this book which taught me to believe in purgatory before I was Catholic, that goodness is something that you have to acclimatise yourself to. The ghosts, if they choose to stay, have to learn to walk on the grass and to eat the apples which are currently so heavy that they would break their teeth on them. Yeah, it just actually reminds me of pretty much anything in life that I have that I find great joy in. It very often didn't even start that way. 
you know, any skill that I began was initially really difficult. And how am I ever going to like this? Or kinds of music that I started listening to. Well, all classical music sounds the same. All salsa music sounds the same. But is actually over time, you you yourself change and you're able to receive this in a, in a different way. There's actually a line in The Magician's Nephew where Lewis says that what you see very much depends on where you're standing and the kind of person that you are. And in this book, he shows us that the kind of person we are might sometimes have to change, that some of our hellish souvenirs, we might need to let go of those and we will be grateful that we've done it in the long run. Yeah, I think he does a great job of showing both how it is a frightening prospect to have to try and tear ourselves away from our our hellish souvenirs, as he puts it, that it isn't just easy or that you would automatically do it, like the question of why wouldn't you choose heaven? But at the same time, how foolish it is to to keep those things and lose heaven for them. Uh, I think this is actually in the preface. So this is a, a good quote to underscore the importance of the preface. But he says, I believe to be sure that any man who reaches heaven will find that what he abandoned, even in plucking out his right eye, was precisely nothing. That kernel of what he was really seeking, even in his most depraved wishes, will be there beyond expectation waiting for him in the high countries. And this ties into an Augustinian idea that you find throughout Lewis's works. It's an understanding of what good and evil are. So evil isn't a thing. It's only a privation. It's a twisting. So the things that we actually have to give up for heaven are nothing. We actually give up nothing because we're going to be receiving what our hearts have been truly desiring. And we've been trying to fulfill that desire very often in other places, seeking good things, but in the wrong way at the wrong time and to the wrong degree. And so when we actually come to heaven, and there's a beautiful scene of this at the end of the Screwtape Letters, where, where the patient encounters his guardian angels and encounters God, and he, he realizes this very fact that he has now gained everything, and that, as Lewis says in the preface, he's actually lost nothing. And very often, we need to be reacclimatized to see how individualistic, drab, and competitive and prideful all of the foolish things that we chase after really are. And we're choosing a far lesser good when we go after those things in the way that we do. Absolutely. I have to give a shout out to one of my favorite people of all of history, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, and his amazing quote to young people. I just think he really spoke into the heart of young people. He said, are we not perhaps all afraid in some way if we let Christ enter fully into our lives, if we open ourselves totally to him, Are we not afraid that he might take something away from us? Are we not perhaps afraid to give something significant, something unique, something that makes life so beautiful? Do we not then risk ending up diminished and deprived of our freedom? No, if we let Christ into our lives, we lose nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing of what makes life free, beautiful and great. No, only in his friendship are the doors of life open wide. Only in this friendship is the greatest potential of human existence truly revealed. Only in this friendship do we experience beauty and liberation. And so today, with great strength and great conviction, on the basis of long personal experience of life, I say to you, dear young people, do not be afraid of Christ. He takes nothing away and he gives you everything. When we give ourselves to him, we receive a hundredfold in return. Yes, open open wide the doors to Christ and you will find true life. Amen. I mean, I think Pope Benedict the Sixteenth is just such an amazing speaker. I love that quote. I'm also a huge fan, probably going to be one of my favorite popes. And we actually share a birthday. And a few years ago, he was in Washington, D.C. on our birthday and we waved at each other. It was uh it was very oh, lovely. That's so cool. <laughs> and he also also read Lewis. I think he's got some lectures on the abolition of man because he saw he he like Lewis saw a real danger in the subjectivism that was entering the world around that time. And his quotation there is that from a, a World Youth Day. I think so. Yeah. It, it it sounds really similar to what Lewis says in Mere Christianity. Yeah. He gives the example first of all of salt. That if you're never going to encounter salt before and you taste a little bit of it. And then you explain to somebody, we put this in all of our food. They would think, well, surely it's all going to taste the same then. Because they don't realize that salt brings out the flavors. And that's what Christ does. And at the end of mere Christianity, he gives this exhortation. He says, you know, throw yourself away, give yourself away and seek Christ and you will find yourself. And he will give you back to yourself 
even more of yourself than you ever were before. That's so true. And I think, again, what Lewis is so, and it, you know, it's hard to talk about joy and, and C.S. Lewis when <laughs> that word is so caught up in his life. So, but the, the fact that C.S. Lewis is able to convey this through joy, I feel like that's something that we're often missing in the way that we talk about goodness, that even when it's hard and even when it's, a painful thing to wrench ourselves away from these things that we cling to, what we receive is joy. And I think there's actually a quote in, in The Great Divorce that we are being prepared for for eternal joy. And I think C.S. Lewis is so good at portraying things as being a joke in the best possible way that, you know, we might be laughing at how silly we look from from heaven. And that's a good thing that, you know, it's not about necessarily about a sort of solemn seriousness that takes ourselves so seriously and uh, i love i've one last quote here which is from thomas merton which i just think is great he says the more we persist in misunderstanding the phenomena of life the more we analyze them out into strange finalities and complex purposes of our own the more we involve ourselves in sadness absurdity and despair but it doesn't matter much because no despair of ours can alter the reality of things or stain the joy of the cosmic dance which is always there Indeed, we are in the midst of it, and it is in the midst of us, for it beats in our very blood, whether we want it to or not. Yet the fact remains that we are invited to forget ourselves on purpose, cast our awful solemnity to the winds, and join in the general dance. I mean, that sounds like a, a scene from Narnia, if I've ever I've heard one. And it's the essence of what Lewis understands humility to be, self-forgetfulness. The, the prideful person who is always thinking about themselves but Merton and Lewis say, nah, don't, don't pay too much attention to yourself. <laughs> look out of yourself. Look out to your neighbor, to others, and to God. And that's where you'll really find life. It's so beautiful. And then he does such a good job of turning that on its head and showing how easily we give all of that up. Yeah, because you look at that and go, how could people say no to joy? Like, how could we say no to this beautiful, incredible landscape? But yet, it really shows us how easy it is to hold on to something. He says, there is always something that they insist on keeping, even at the price of misery. There's always something they prefer to joy, that is, to reality. And I think that's such a chilling thought that we also can make other things what we would choose instead of joy and turn ourselves in on, on ourselves that way. Dr. Peter Kreeft, he's written oh, about a million books. Uh, <laughs> but I heard him give a talk and he said, we're morally insane. There's a definition of insanity that you see kicking around. It's usually attributed to someone like Einstein. I'm not sure who really said it. But insanity is doing the same thing again and again and again and expecting a different result. Well, that's really what we do with sin. You know, how many times have you done something that you knew probably wasn't the right thing and it failed to live up to its promises? Yet you did it again and again and again. And the flip side of how many times do you know that doing something will make you feel better? <laughs> it won't take your medicine. <laughs> Yeah, we mentioned before the show the sermon, The Weight of Glory, and Lewis has got a vivid example in there. He says that when compared with heavenly glory, we're like a child who just wants to keep on making mud pies in a slum because the child has no conception of how great it would be to have a holiday by the sea. We keep choosing the lesser of all of the gifts. Like I said, morally insane. <laughs> I'm I'm actually a big fan of the uh, Disney animated film of Alice in Wonderland. And she has that song she sings to herself where she says, I give myself very good advice, but I seldom ever follow it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I thought maybe we could talk about a couple of the examples of the different ghostly characters that come up from hell. And because each one is a sort of vignette of a way that sin works on the soul to prevent it from accepting joy and grace and God. Yeah, it's like a series of case studies yeah. on how we end up doing the very thing that McDonald says, choosing to keep one of our hellish souvenirs rather than accepting heaven. Yeah, and I think he kind of boldly opens it with someone who we might normally feel quite a bit of sympathy with. He's he's this character who is met by someone he knew in life, the heavenly bright person that comes to meet him is this person he knew in life who he knew to be a murderer and you know I think a lot of us would be pretty annoyed if we met a known murderer in on our first day in heaven a murderer that we knew personally yeah and and you you know that indignation of saying well how did you get here first and how come I was a good man all of my life and I think this idea of 
protesting that I did my best, I didn't murder anyone, I was pretty good, is really ingrained in modern society. And it's what so many people answer when they say they're not religious. And they say, well, I believe in something spiritual, and I'm a good person. And isn't that enough? And, you know, I think there are worse things to be. (laughs) I'm not trying to disparage that, but I think it's really shown up in The Great Divorces as actually being a stumbling block. And he has this line of saying he wants his rights, he wants to be given what he was owed, he, he did what he could in his life and he thinks that was enough and he deserves heaven in his view and uh, and that he doesn't want, and the quote is, he doesn't want bleeding charity. And of course, the bright spirit says, please take the bleeding charity. <laughs> yeah, he wants heaven on his own terms. And I mean, really, that is the consistent pattern throughout all of these ghosts. They, they want heaven, but on their own terms. And their terms are their hellish souvenirs that they bring in. Or in this man's case, he wants heaven, but he doesn't want this other guy to be there. He doesn't want to be uh, he doesn't want to be part of a club that would let in this guy. Yeah. Isn't that that great Groucho Marx line where he says, mm-hmm. I wouldn't want to be a part of any club that would let me in. <laughs> yeah. And and uh, and, and it, you, it, it's it's really true in this case, because he he has devised his own standard and he thinks he's done rather well. And this guy has failed. And when you were talking about what people say when they're not religious, one thing I, I often hear is, you know, I'm a pretty good guy. I mean, I'm not Hitler or anything. <laughs> And I can't help but think, so that's our standard? I'm not Hitler? Yeah, I'm doing pretty well. Uh, nobody ever says it around the other way. It's like, I'm a very sinful person. I'm no Mother Teresa. <laughs> it, because it's, by what standard are you willing to judge here? And he wants to judge by his own standard. And it's just dripping with pride. Because he thinks that he deserves this. He thinks that God owes him this. And that the other guy, the murderer, the one who threw himself on the bleeding charity, on the cross of Christ, he doesn't deserve it and therefore should be excluded. And Lewis even pushes us further to consider that the things that we might consider the worst on earth are not necessarily the worst sins in the eyes of heaven, because the bright spirit says that the occasion on which he murdered someone was the work of a moment and a moment of anger and rashness, but that he had killed this this ghost who was his boss over and over again in his heart. And then that was the real thing that hardened his heart. And then that was the more difficult sin to overcome. And I think Lewis is so good at challenging what we think are our worst faults and actually pulling out what might be really our worst faults. And yet the beautiful part of that is that the, this bright spirit then says that that is why I'm here, to serve you, because I wronged you. And I love that idea of the soul of the bright spirits also trying so desperately hard to bring others into heaven with them. That seems to be their over, overriding desire. And we later find out that they have they have travelled distances that we can't even imagine in order for the possibility of this actually happening. Even when, unfortunately, in this book, in nearly every case, the ghost turns them down. Yeah, it's heartbreaking to see how many of them... There's a couple we just don't know. We, we leave them before we find out what happens to them. But Very for, tactfully by Lewis. Yeah, but for the most part, we see them reject the the offer of, of heaven. And so, I don't know, maybe we should sum up some of the other, other ghosts. Just before we do that, one other thing I wanted to say when you talk about Lewis's scale isn't often what we'd imagine. In Mere Christianity, Lewis, in book three, he talks about Christian morality. And he inevitably talks about sexual morality. And he warns his readers in that chapter, a lot of people seem to think that this is the heart of Christian morality. He says it's not. We'll get to that later. And in a later chapter entitled The Great Sin, he explains that the real heart, the real central point of Christian morality all revolves around pride and humility. And Lewis is just standing in a 2,000-year tradition of spiritual masters that saw spiritual sins as far worse than physical animalistic sins. Those are still bad. Those can still damn you. But purely spiritual sins are so much worse because they can be so much more insidious and they can even smuggle their way into religion. That's how you make Pharisees. Yeah, I think it's interesting to use the idea of smuggling it in because I think so many of the ghost characters wouldn't even recognize the sins that they have as severe faults in their character it's not like we'll see one later that knows he's wrestling with lust and that's the only one that actually has any chance of wrestling with it openly because for the most part 
most of them don't even know that they have this sin that they're clinging to. They just see it as what's due to them, that they're they're allowed to to have this souvenir of hell, as we've been saying. So I think we were just going to sum up a couple of the other ghosts to show the different ways that they cling on to their various sins. Do you want to take this, Phoebe? Yeah, well, I think one of the ones for me that was really chilling is you meet this Episcopal ghost who is a theologian who has squandered his intellect to the extent that he enjoys the journey more than the actual result. He's no longer looking for answers and ends up rejecting heaven because he doesn't like the idea of there being an absolute truth. He calls and it stifling. Stifling, shocking. But finality is stifling. Yeah, and there's that challenge of that he's forgotten what his intellect was given to him for, for finding answers, and he's called to go back to being a little child and knowing what his intellect for, knowing what inquiry was for. And he can't do that. And he ends up going back to hell to read a theological paper. <laughs> and I think especially for us who talk about these things quite a lot, mm. that's really chilling that something like the inquiry into the nature of God, that if it doesn't mesh with love, if it doesn't fall under the love of God, then it could be what keeps us from heaven. Yeah, he is probably my most favorite and least favorite ghost for that exact reason. And you say, and you're right, it, it, it's chilling. The idea that even the pursuit of God could be the very thing that takes you away from faith. Not because you discover things that undermine it, but because you get much more obsessed and much more interested in your own opinion and being uh, shocking and new and daring. And he, the paper that he's reading is, well, what if Christ hadn't, hadn't died when he had? What would have his, his mature ideas have been? He says, it's at that point you realise what a, what, a, what a shocking tragedy the crucifixion was. Because he doesn't believe in the resurrection. So, you know. And I think there's a bit of a theme because I remember with him, he also is appalled at the idea that he wouldn't have anything to say or to explore or to contribute in heaven. And later there's a an artist who rejects heaven because he can't be famous there. And there's no such thing as being esteemed in that way for your work. And And then again, later there's another ghost. There's a line which says that like, you didn't need me. And, and the bright spirit that they're talking to said, well, of course I don't need you. <laughs> like I'm in heaven. And this idea that this like clinging to the status, to your ability to contribute, to your ability to be needed. There's also another line which says, you can't, you can't hurt me anymore. And the, the woman involved is dumbstruck, like horrified at the idea that nothing she says can hurt this person anymore. The fact that you can't push people or can't control people is so tied up in an inability to embrace God and, and to realize that it is his hand that does all things and not, not us. And we learn a lot of these bad lessons on earth. I mean, something that's underlying a lot of these ideas is utility, that you are worth something if you are useful, if you can do things. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not how love works. So if you find if you find your value entirely in what you can do, well, when you come to heaven, what are you what are you going to do? What are you what are, what are you going to make? What are you going to achieve? It's like you are you're surrounded by um, saints and angels. <laughs> <laughs> if if you have an inability just to be able to love and be loved, you're not going to want to be there. Which is why that the uh, the Episcopal ghost goes back to hell to read a paper and lead a Bible study. <laughs> Yeah, I think there is something chillingly ironic about the idea that there's a Bible study in hell. I think the other really fascinating thing that he says is that he mocks the spirit that comes to meet him for believing in heaven and hell, despite the fact that he's standing right in the middle of it. And I think this theme of self-delusion, and, and of course, all of the sin is a type of delusion that, that this thing could be better than God. But there's a real sense of delusion of like, just impracticability that you're you're standing in the middle of heaven and you can't even see it there's another character who wants to try and steal one of the golden apples and bring it back down to hell and it like what what would you even do with it like the, what's the plan here that you can be so focused on yourself that you're totally turned in and you don't see what's happening around you well that turning in there's a latin phrase that when we went through this book in our season, I think I said it pretty much in every episode, incavatus in se, 
it was something that St. Augustine writes, and it was taken up by Martin Luther. And the the point is, is, is it's a soul turned in on itself. And when something turns in on itself, it usually dies. Uh, and the constant invitation of the solid people, the bright people, to these ghosts is to stop turning in on themselves and turn outwards, because this is where life is going to be. And there's the promise that if they start walking on the grass, if they'll lean on these bright spirits who have come to guide them, they will become stronger and more solid as, as they get filled with the life of heaven, rather than disappear into nothingness of the grey town. Yeah, there's a wonderful quote from the poet W.H. Auden, which says, we would rather be ruined than changed. We would rather die in our dread than climb the cross of the moment and let our illusions die. Woof. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's from a poem called, I think it's called The Age of Anxiety. So, I mean, that feels very prescient. <laughs> um, yeah, that sense of, obviously at this stage, all of the souls are already dead, but there is that sense of they would rather forfeit everything than let their illusions of, of what they think is good die and be open to a greater good. Yeah, they're hanging on to it for dear life. I think I gave this example when we were reading through it of a way that you can apparently catch monkeys. What you do is you take a hollowed out gourd, you put some nuts in it, and then you go and glue it to the bottom of a forest floor. You then walk away, the monkeys come down, they put their hands into the gourds, and it's got a very narrow neck, and then they grab the nuts or whatever delicious treat is at the bottom, and they try and withdraw their hand, but now their hand is a fist and they can't actually take their hand out of the gourd. So then you come along and knock them on the head and you've just caught a monkey. And we're sort of the same when it comes to sin. And these ghosts are the same. They are so trapped by the thing that, that they're obsessed with, with their hellish souvenirs, that they are willing to give up everything, even their liberty, even all of the promises of heaven, simply because they can't let go of what they've been hanging on to all of their lives. Yeah, I think it's really potently shown in the there's a ghost that comes up who has lost her son during her life and mm -hmm. is very distraught at this this fact of her life and her life had then been spent in this sort of performative grief where she keeps not only her life but the life of the rest of her family on hold and nothing can penetrate this quote love that she has for her son but that forsakes everything else and so she arrives in the foothills of heaven and she's met not by her son and she's very annoyed that even at this point she's still not met by her son it's her brother and everything is focused on her reclaiming her son and I think he even says that we're not even asking you to love something more than your son Michael but that you just have to love anything like anything even a little bit other than him and and she won't do it and she would rather there's a line that says it may well be at this moment she's demanding to have him down in hell with her that kind is sometimes perfectly ready to plunge the soul that they love in endless misery if only they can still in some fashion possess it i'm going to offer a slight correction the soul they say they love that's it. Because that's that's what all of this turns on. And Lewis explores this in his book, The Four Loves. Uh, he uses four different Greek terms for different kinds of love. The, the love that you have for family, the love that you have for friends, love that you have for a romantic partner and uh, the love of God. And the point that he makes throughout all of these books is the natural loves. So the love of family, uh, the love of friends and the love of romantic uh, individuals. These These loves can take the place of the love of God if we let it. These loves can become demons when we try and make them gods. And we only do that because these things are so close to the real thing. The love that you have for your family, the love that you have for your friends, the love that you have for your spouse is, is, is so close to the love of God. Because what do you do in marriage? You want to give the other person everything. It's only because it's so good. Uh, as MacDonald says in, in this book, he says that brass is often confused for gold, much more often than clay is, because it looks so much like it. And this woman has taken something that is good, the love of a mother for a son, but she has elevated it to a position that, that is not right. It doesn't belong there. And she has become so myopic, so tunnel visioned that she can't see anything else. Yeah, like she even starts traveling towards the mountain to like go and see God. But she's like, yeah, take me to God so long as I can see Michael. And the, the spirit is like, no, 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 no. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. And that we can't use God as a means to an end to hold on to the things that we love either. And I think he does a really clever thing where he points out how, even though obviously 
loving your family and loving your children and all of those kinds of love are good things that in some ways that it almost can trip us up more if we mistake it for the best thing, the highest good. He says, those that hate goodness are sometimes nearer than those who know nothing at all about it and think that they have it already. We're back at Pharisees again. When you think that that you have everything already, it makes you blind to what you might actually not yet have. Yeah, that section then goes to is a discussion between Lewis and MacDonald. And it's a really interesting discussion where MacDonald is bringing up the idea that maybe we should be having these conversations in some form on earth. Now, he does say that Lewis is not a good enough man to tell a grieving mother that her love is is misconstrued in some way, that it does take tact and it takes knowing and loving the person themselves. It's not just an excuse to go in and barge in and accuse everyone of all of their faults, but that there is something that says that we might be better if we actually were brave enough to suggest to people that the ways that they're living their lives and the ways that they're even expressing love are fallen in some way and that that it's not good enough to just leave people where they're at because it might actually lead them to hell. And there's some good news in that because that sounds... That sounds kind of tough. It's true, but it sounds kind of tough. But there's some good news to this as well. And it's the same thing uh, that we encountered earlier on, that you actually find you will lose nothing. Everything goes through a process of resurrection. In that section, Lewis says that, well, through MacDonald, every natural love will rise again and live forever in this country, but none will rise again unless it has been buried. And that idea, you find it in Till We Have Faces, you find, you find it in screw tape Letters, you find it in Mere Christianity. The idea that when we give up something, when we give it to God, we get it back better and more permanently and more fully alive than we would have ever been able to get it before. In, in Mere Christianity, he, he talks about uh, a, a little boy that wants to buy his father a present, says, Daddy, give me sixpence. So I can go and buy your present. He says, the, the, the dad's going to be an idiot if he thinks that he's, that he's sixpence up on the deal. And as an aside, that's actually where the band Sixpence None the Richer, that's where they get their name from. Oh, no the, the idea that we get everything from God anyway. So it is insane to even regard anything as mine. Mm. Everything is God's anyway. And what he wants from us is for us to give the, all of these things to him so that he can then just give them back to us. Yeah. And I think it's really telling that the character of Lewis responds to that quote from MacDonald by saying that the saying is almost too hard for us. Mm. It really shows how easily we get tripped up. And MacDonald actually replies saying, but it's cruel not to say it. They that know have grown afraid to speak. That is why sorrows that used to purify now only fester. And there can be the misconception that in order to love God more, we have to love people less, that in order to preserve the natural loves, we just have to love God more or we, and we have to love people less. No, no, there, there's no limit on this love. It just does have to be rightly ordered, though. You know, you, the, the, the woman who has lost her son, she isn't to be cured by loving her son less, but by having that love purified and ordered. That's the solution. She doesn't have, she have to give up anything other than her own myopic vision. Yeah, and I think one of the things we really see in the Bright Spirits is that their love for the ghosts also leads them to say stuff that we go, ooh, that's quite hard. <laughs> and I think, I mean, these are also the conversations that I had at the very end of time when there are no more choices left, like this is the last choice to be made. So there is a finality to them that maybe they're not exactly the conversations we would have with people on Earth. But there is also a challenge that asks us, how much do we love the people around us to be willing to have those conversations and to be willing to take the harder road of saying something that might also lead to someone's salvation? Do we love the friendship more than the friend? Mm, Yeah. Because when we're afraid to say something that we think somebody needs to hear, what we're saying is we actually prefer the equilibrium and peace that we currently have, we actually love that more than we love the other person. Because if we truly love the other person, we would say what needed to be said for their ultimate good. And it deserves saying, this doesn't mean that you charge in like a bull in a china shop. Uh, (laughs) You can do all these things very subtly. But I think there is a switch that we have to go over. there's There's a decision that we have to make when we know we want the best for somebody. And that might mean that we have to have a difficult conversation that we really don't want to have to have. But what's wonderful in The Great Divorce is we're in eternity at this point and there are no more secrets. 
We spoke about the, the self-righteous ghost earlier. He had been saying that he was a good man. And the problem is, is that the bright spirit actually now knows that's not actually true, is it? You weren't nice to your employees. You weren't nice to your family. You didn't actually do your best. Yeah, and I think also that in prioritizing the friendship over the friend, we also lose the friendship. Like how the ghosts lose heaven in this seeking, we can lose a friendship by failing to say that which needs to be said as well. That things go stale and that we don't actually grow together in Christ. Yeah, and I think I think it's really important, like we've been saying, that this isn't a free license to go in and start criticizing people's lives. But I think what's telling is that I think there's a very potent trend at the moment which actually places just tolerance and acceptance and not interfering in people's lives as actually the highest good. That this is how you act if you're if you love someone, if you're virtuous, if you are a good person, that this sense of like tolerance being the highest good like we were saying it's not about going in and changing everyone that you see but just a switch in understanding which says that maybe I'll have to wait for the right time or maybe I'll have to do this subtly or slowly but that the best good isn't just to accept them as they are if they are in a particular wrong that there is somewhere better to try and lead them to as a friend and that that obviously starts with ourselves as well. Yeah. That any of those conversations, because we're not bright spirits, we are all ghosts trying to help each other, <laughs> that we have to be willing to look at our own lives first and to accept those criticisms equally. Yeah. And Jesus said something about uh, having specks in your eyes and, and logs and to be careful about all of that. Uh, <laughs> one thing that I did in my late 20s when I had a really good group of guy friends, we actually called it the men's huddle. Uh, we would we would we would meet every week or two and share our lives with each other. And one of the things that we all explicitly said to each other is that I'm giving you permission to speak into my life. If you think that I am slacking, if you think that I am not treating my girlfriend right, not doing a good job at work, etc., all these things, I want you to tell me to give somebody close to you who you respect. You regard as somebody that is seeking after God, who's someone who has at least the beginnings of wisdom, giving them permission to be able to speak into your life. Because particularly when they actually do that, you'll often need to be reminded that you asked for this. <laughs> yeah, I think that really cleverly brings us to the one ghost that we see who accepts heaven, the ghost with the lizard on his shoulder, because he has this lizard, which we find out is a, a kind of manifestation of his lust. And he comes across an angel who says, do you want me to get rid of it for you? And he makes every excuse in the book. But notably, he also just says, I'll deal with it myself. I, d I didn't mean to bother you. You don't need to interfere. I'll just go away, deal with it myself, and then I'll come back. And I think that's so familiar to all of us that we say like, oh, I won't tell my friends about this thing that I'm struggling with because I'll just deal with it. And then when I can have the triumph story of saying, and I overcame it and God worked in my life. And it's like, well, actually the thing that might have helped was sharing it with friends who might have actually been able to help me. And it, I'd also say it's a very British trait, particularly very English. The, oh, I don't want to be a bother. Oh, this is, this is causing far too much fuss. I'm just going to go away and, and deal with it maybe. And uh, you don't bother yourself. Oh, I'm terribly, terribly sorry. I'm not feeling well enough today. Maybe another time. <laughs> it, that, that exchange is beautiful if you try and put something that you're struggling with into that story. Because mm. these are all the, the same excuses that we make. It's like, well, I'm not feeling quite well. Now, today isn't a good day. Oh, I'm sure a gradual process will be a much better way of ferreting out this sin that I can't quite shake. Uh, I, I don't want to get you involved. Don't worry. I'm, I'll be much better just handling this by myself. And of course, that's not the case. You know, you, 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 there's, there's, there's a reason that, that God put us into community to support one another. You know, cord of three strands is not easily broken. Uh, you know, and if someone falls down, well, if you've got a friend there to help pick you up, you'll be in far, far better shape. Yeah. And again, once again, he shows that it's not an easy process. You know, the ghost is terrified that this process is going to kill him. And the angel reassures him that it won't. And then he, he begins to act and you can, it starts hurting him. And he says, you're burning me. You're hurting me now. I never said it wouldn't hurt you. I said it wouldn't kill you. Which I've always thought would be a wonderful quotation to stick up at a gym. <laughs> I never said it wouldn't hurt you. I said it wouldn't kill you. 
probably. <laughs> I, I always think that it's a funny quote for someone to say to someone who's already dead. Of course it won't kill you, you're dead. <laughs> but that exchange is beautiful because we see what happens. That we see the angel clasp his hands around this lizard, wring its neck and throw it on the ground. And we then see this ghost start to become bigger and more solid. But not just that. We see what happens to the lizard. Remember, this was his lust that it too gets transformed. It gets transformed into this magnificent steed. And not just that, this is the very steed on which he rides into heaven. And that is just a gorgeous picture of what our sins, when they can be overcome, can actually do. That they can actually be the very means of grace for ourselves and for other people. Because you never know, this guy might come back as a bright spirit to come and help somebody else into heaven as well later. But the idea that our sins can be transformed. When they get, we give them over to the potter's hand, he can do something incredible with them. And that when we say that no part of hell can enter heaven, that is absolutely true. But it also doesn't mean that just because there was a sin connected with us at one point, that God can't transform that into something heavenly that brings us closer to him. Absolutely. Yeah. Which I think we had a, a last point here, which is just delving into a little bit more about that idea of of the separation of heaven and hell. And as I, I, I mentioned at the start, the name of the book is based on this William Blake poem, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, which kind of gives this slightly mealy mouth suggestion that you can have, have your cake and eat it too in some ways. And Lewis is really categorical about this, that you can't keep holding on to things that are not of heaven and expect to be able to enter heaven. The book of Revelation says that. It says nothing unclean can enter heaven. Therefore, it needs to be cleaned up first. Again, what a, what a beautiful portrayal of purgatory. I also love, it's in the letters to Malcolm where he says, "Would you, if you come to heaven covered in dirt and dust and, and you're told you can enter the great banquet and you say, I'd rather be clean first. And again, that line, it may hurt. Even still, I'd rather be clean. Yeah, and the, I think in that illustration as well, he's like, but everybody here accepts you as you are, that you still of yourself don't want to stay in that dirt in that particular banquet illustration that even if it hurts it is better to be clean yeah. and i think it also explains really well as well why there has to be a hell i think in in your episodes david you were you made a really great point of like the need to quarantine things that cannot and should not enter into heaven Mm -hmm. McDonald, uh, he alludes to Aesop's fables at one point. He talks about you'd make a dog in a manger, the tyrant of the universe. And in Aesop's fable, he's talking about a dog that is in a manger full of hay, can't eat the hay, but it will bark at any animal that tries to get near it to eat the hay. So the dog can't consume it, but it's also making sure that nobody else does either. And this is his image of why there needs to be a hell so that joy can last so it's not constantly held hostage by those who are refusing it. Yeah, and the, the ghost that this is in relation to, it's referred to in the book as the, the dwarf and the tragedian. And it's this small ghost that is holding on to this figure who's a, essentially a, a false self, like a face that he's put on for all of these years. And he's met by his wife, who was this essentially nobody, but in heaven she's glorified as this amazing saint and she has this big retinue of all of the people and animals that she touched in in her life i guess I, it sounds like lewis comes down on the side of maybe that your dog will be in heaven with you <laughs> <laughs> oh i i think he definitely would he, he writes about animals so much lewis definitely <laughs> had a, a soft spot it was actually a cat that was at the kilns that it, all of its teeth had fallen out and they were asking well what do we do with this cat do we put it down he says no 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 he's a pensioner and so he would have his cook prepare fish three times a week that would then be fed to the cat so that it could uh, could stay alive and, and uh, continue to haunt the kilns. Wow. Well, Phoebe's found yet another reason to love Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> he does also point out that cats have a bad reputation and perhaps it's part they're partially to blame for that because they don't seem to like uh, people or each other. <laughs> Maybe they just have good taste. <laughs> but there's, yeah, there's this great exchange, which I find one of the most interesting, but also perhaps even the most upsetting sections in the book where the wife who's trying to 
essentially like plead with her husband to let go of this false self and so that he can enter enter heaven with her and you know it should be such a beautiful thing and yet he can't let go of this this false face which she goes on to explain is the way that he uses pity against other people to blackmail them into acting less than themselves into foregoing their joy into turning away from the better thing and lewis finds it difficult and i think we all find it difficult that he misses out on his chance of heaven and and wasn't there more that she could do and that this self-created misery is there no way to, to kind of step in and intervene with someone and mcdonald in the book says would you rather he still had the power of tormenting her he did it many a day and many a year in their earthly life. And Lewis says, what some people say on earth is that the final loss of one's soul gives the lie to all the joys that are saved. And McDonald says, you see, it does not. And there's that sense of like this wrestling with, well, it feels right that everyone should be saved. And it feels right that no one, especially no one who was loved in their life could be left behind. But that by an insistence on manipulating and insistence on control that we've kind of mentioned before, that that has to be let go before you can enter heaven. And if you can't let it go, then you can't enter heaven because it's not just to allow people to go on being manipulated and hurt and tormented by others. Yeah, this is the line that I alluded to earlier. He says, uh, the demand of the loveless and the self-imprisoned that they should be allowed to blackmail the universe, that till they consent to be happy on their own terms, no one else shall taste joy, that theirs should be the final power, that hell should be able to veto heaven. This, this is where he talks about that a dog in a manger becoming the tyrant of the universe, that until he gets what he wants, nobody else can. I was reflecting actually on this point a little bit because I'm reading a book about Tolkien and it I had a section on saying that so much of what the Lord of the Rings and even the Hobbit is centered on is the virtue of pity. And in this way, it's the virtue of pity to stay both Bilbo and Frodo's hands when they could harm and they don't. And in this example, Lewis, he does distinguish between the, the action and, and, and the passion of pity, but he kind of casts pity in quite a negative light. And I think it's just kind of interesting that the two authors explore pity in a very different way to each other, that one is looking at the goodness of pity. And I would say that in Tolkien's case, what he's exploring is the use of pity to act better than you might. And Lewis here is demonstrating the ability for pity to cause you to act less than you might because you are concerned about the other person, that you will lower your standards in order to accommodate them. I think the difference is when these stories take place. In The Great Divorce, we are now in eternity. In Lord of the Rings, we're still on our way to Mordor. Because <laughs> you could say that Frodo makes the wrong decision that Bilbo makes the wrong decision. No, this is somebody who is clearly going to try and strangle you in your sleep if you give him half a chance, that it would have made much more sense to just put him out of his misery. But in Lord of the Rings, we're still in time. And Iluvatar, God, is going to be using this, this virtue of pity for his own ends, that it will turn out to just be an instrument by which the great evil in the land is going to be destroyed, and we're going to end up with this eucatastrophe. I would suggest that in The Great Divorce, we're at the eucatastrophic part. Good grief, that's definitely not right. But you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's a really good point. That, Like Phoebe was saying earlier, that these conversations happen in a very different way than, than they might on an earthly plane, because we're at this moment of, as Phoebe said, it's almost like it, this is the one moment of death because one of the angels says, actually the one who, who kills the lizard, that this is all time. This is all moments. You can't get away from this moment. This is There's not a later time. There's not a better time to do something. This is the one moment. And, and so it's almost like, like Phoebe said, the moment of death where your judgment is being made and your choice is being made. And this is the only moment. And so this is the last thing that can be said. And in Lewis's conception, this door is locked from the inside. Mm. They're doing it to themselves. There's a few tough parts when MacDonald is speaking about this that I remember really struggling with when I first read it. But he always counterbalances it by saying that there is still this choice, though. He says that every disease that submits to a cure shall be cured. And he says, but at the same time, we're not going to call blue yellow for those that don't like being jaundice. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really interesting that also the joy that they're choosing against is so much bigger than they are. 
that it isn't that the that the person who was giving the pity it's not that Sarah needs to be protected from her husband because he no longer has the power to hurt her that she says I'm in love itself and out of it I will not go that she's immersed in so much joy that those in hell so turned in on themselves refusing that joy can no longer cause an ache in her heart and cause her to try and to go out of that love that Lewis says that the passion of pity the pity we merely suffer the ache that draws men to concede what should not be conceded and to flatter when they should speak truth that that pity can't draw her into evil and therefore the ghosts that are vanishing into hell that we see how they're really small that George MacDonald at this great moment of the book leans down and points to a tiny crack in the grass and goes, yeah, there, that's a crack that you came through, or no bigger than this crack. That evil is so much smaller than good, and that the choices we make to choose joy are... I yeah, think the clarity. Good. Sorry, yeah, that clarity. I, anyway. <laughs> we don't get suckered by things that sucker us in here on Earth, because we can see things clearly. On Earth, you know, Frodo and Bilbo... When when they're being manipulated by Gollum, they can't necessarily see it. Yeah. But at the other end of the story, looking back, they can see things more clearly. I think something similar in Eternity, where you can you can see that I'm being trying to be drawn away from the greatest good by something that is clearly less. Yeah, and I love that moment where you see that it's actually just so small, and you think back on on the man who was trying to steal the apple, and that like the idea that you would try to get this apple through this tiny gap in the ground that all of hell is like a puff of smoke in comparison to to heaven and i think that really goes to the heart of of lewis's theme on on choice and he has this great perspective where he says that that virtue and sin kind of work retroactively that you will look back on all of the things that you thought were the greatest hardships and thought were the worst things to go through and see them as actually goods on a path to the greatest good that you can see god's action in them but also even more tellingly in some ways that when you say i would rather keep this sin than go to heaven that just let me have this and i'll suffer the consequences that once you've had it when you look back it's all spoiled you you didn't get the thing out of it that you wanted you didn't even get the pleasure that you were participating in in sinning because it it, it spoils everything even retroactively you don't get to remember it in a positive way and so this idea that like you stand at a choice between heaven and hell and that he just does such a good job of showing both where you might choose hell but why that's such a foolish thing to do and that we need to stop conning ourselves <laughs> when we make those kinds of bargains in our head yeah and i think that the greatness of heaven and how much stronger the virtues are to the vices in the end i think really helps to explain that that idea of the smoke of the damned going up in front of the blessed that if hell is so small you can't it's become so small that you can't see it anymore and I just wanted to say on that point about heaven and hell being retrospective, I think experience tells us that that's true. If you listen to anybody giving any kind of testimony, really about anything, they will be retelling their story. And it's very often in the lowest moments, they will see these things as mercies. Mm. As it, it was at this point that I was called. It was at this point that I saw clearly. And this is what helped lead me to where I am today. Here in the States, country songs are all the rage and there's a song called uh, i think it's called this and it's basically somebody recounting all of the signs that he missed all of the lights that didn't change at the right time and he says but it led me here to this and then he describes his wife and his family and all this other stuff and in the moment all of those things seemed bad but they brought me to here there's another song that says god bless the broken road that led me here to you which is just delightful it, but it's it's true. When we finally arrive at where we know our heart has has ached for, even the smaller things in this world, whether, whether it's a career or a town or whatever it else, you look back and you see the road that took you there and even the things that were terrible, you almost wouldn't want to be without them because they shape so much of the journey and you see the hand of God in it ultimately bringing you to where it is you've arrived. Yeah, and I think since we've been talking about Tolkien, it might be worth bringing up Leaf by Niggle, which is a very short story. I would recommend people to read it. I didn't realize it was so short, so you've no excuse. It's like 30 pages. You'll get it done very quickly. And it's it's almost like the Tolkien version of The Great Divorce in that it's mm -hmm. this 
surprisingly allegorical story for a <laughs> Tolkien who hate, notoriously hated allegory, but it's about a man who spends his life trying to paint this painting, knowing that it's called The Journey, but I mean, I think even from the start, it's very obvious that the journey is death, but that he should be preparing for this journey and he's not, and he's trying to get his painting done and everything keeps getting in the way. And he's got this annoying neighbor who keeps sending him on errands. And as he comes to the end, right before he's supposed to go on this journey, he keeps running out of time and more things go wrong and he has to go fetch medicine for the neighbor's wife and he gets sick on because he's caught in a storm and everything goes wrong but what happens is is that he ends up in this again a very kind of great divorce sort of afterlife mm-hmm. in some ways and he hears these voices talking about him and talking about his contribution and why he might deserve to stay in this purgatorial state or move on to a different level towards heaven and again it's saying that these things that he counted as interruptions at the time were actually the opportunities for grace. And luckily for for Nigel, he actually responds to them and he doesn't look for anything in return. And more than his great artistic plans at the time, it's these moments where he gave up his chance for artistic greatness in order to do a, a small good in an interruption or a nuisance or for someone he doesn't really like or get on with. And I think where... The Great Divorce shows us very clearly where our small sins really trip us up. I think Tolkien also really shows us how the really small things that we don't count very highly actually do contribute to us moving towards God. And the movement is exactly the same as it is in The Great Divorce. When when, when he begins the story, he is all self-focused on the project of what he wants to do. And everything else is, as you say, just an interruption. But as we go through the story, as he goes through this purgatorial process, he, he starts looking out from himself to parish, to his neighbor. And you see then something beautiful then begin to quite literally flourish. And it's as he does, as he makes that journey, that's how he moves through the story. Yeah. And I think it's really telling the first opportunity he gets to speak to one of these these voices that is talking about him. The first thing he does is ask for Parish. How is he? Have you been able to help him? His leg really hurt him. And it, I like, I'm worried about him. And when he gets to this next stage where it's almost like he gets to explore his own creative talent again in a more divine space, the thing he thinks is, he says, of course, he said, what I need is Parish. There are lots of things about earth, plants and trees that he knows that I don't. I need help and advice. I ought to have gotten it sooner. This sense that it's actually collaborative, that the thing that he really needs is somebody else and somebody else who knows other things. And and I was thinking that it's almost exactly the inverse of the artist ghost in The Great Divorce, who is so focused on, am I going to be famous? What can I contribute? Who can I meet that's more important? I couldn't possibly give up my fame. But Niggle gives up all of these things and in that is actually able both to move towards God himself, but leave behind something that also brings people towards God as well. My wife actually just read Leaf by Niggle this past month, and she was talking about it, and I couldn't help but think of marriage. (laughs) It's like, I needed help. I should have got married sooner. I really (laughs) should have. (laughs) But there, there is the idea of what marriage is meant to do. It's meant to lead you to heaven. And it, it's now a collaborative effort that you are trying to get your spouse to heaven. That is your job. And they're trying to get you there. And it's through that collaboration that life is given in both figurative and very literal senses. Mm-hmm beautiful. And I love the idea that we're actually helping each other to heaven as a community and as a community of humanity and as Catholics and Christians, and that that can happen here on earth. And that can also happen through intercession and through those who have gone before us still reaching out and wanting to draw us deeper. There's that sense of the enormous continuity. And like we're recording this on the feast of St. Catherine of Siena. And one of my best friends has joined a convent and taken that name. And the idea of that continuation, that constantly leading towards God. And I think that's what's so beautiful about the great divorce, that it is this example of how we move towards God, which is so difficult to see in our own earth, but it's so hard to put the perspective of heaven on the simple little things that happen to us on earth. And all this is summed up in The Weight of Glory. At the very end of that sermon, Lewis makes the point that you've never met a mere mortal. It's, it's, it's immortals that you meet every day, creatures that are going to live forever. And he says, you're either helping them 
towards a hellish future or a heavenly future, one way or the other. And he even goes so far as to say that your neighbor, aside from the blessed sacrament, is the closest thing, most heavenly, most holy thing that you will encounter in this life, right next to the blessed sacrament. Wow. That's kind of terrifying. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And amazing as well. You know, he just has the ability to put new eyes on all of his readers, I think. And and it also articulates something which, again, you find Lewis writes the same things again and again in all of these different places, giving us different images to help us grasp them. And in Mere Christianity, he talks about heavenly and hellish creatures, the idea that it's, it's in the small decisions that we make, in the day-to-day -day moments, each little thing will be shaping us for one of two possible destinies. And it's purely as to whether or not do we do the next thing that is going to make us a little bit more like a creature that's fit for heaven or one that's fit for hell. Oh. That's perfect. Thank you so much. It was so great discussing this with you. I had such a great time. I just wanted to talk about this again. Season two seems so long ago. <laughs> I know that was a whole pandemic ago. <laughs> I have one last question to ask you, which is we have to get what we're enjoying at the moment. So David, what are you enjoying at the moment? I am very much enjoying rubbing my wife's belly because inside her belly is my son. We just found out that it is a son this past weekend uh, who will be making his appearance into the world on probably the 9th of September. This is my child, so he's bound to be on time. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I just have to say that's that's kind of my life at the moment. It's the first thing that I think about when I wake up in the morning. I roll over and see, see this mound next to me uh, that is not only my wife, but my son. Uh, <laughs> And uh, and so I get to spend significant chunks of my day rubbing my wife's belly and talking to my child. Uh, and one thing that always makes my wife laugh is when I'm when I'm talking to him. At the end, once I've finished saying what I want to say, the life life lesson that I want to impart, I always end with, "This is your father." <laughs> and she finds that really funny. But you know, how else is he going to know? It's like a very formal telephone sign off. <laughs> exactly. Well, this child is half English. So my wife is half Irish, half Lebanese. So there's a, there's a whole load of things going on in there. So I need to make sure that the, the English part of my child is, is reinforced. That is wonderful. Well, Phoebe, you, I, I'm not expecting you to have anything quite so <laughs> life-changing, but would you like to tell us what you're enjoying at the moment? Mine is... A far less significant, massive congratulations, by the way. I have been enjoying Smith of Wooden Major, oh, which wonderful. is another of the short stories in the book of Leaf by Nagel. And very interestingly, it's Tolkien's response to some of George MacDonald's work. And I'm a big George MacDonald fan anyway, and we've been talking about him in The Great Force. But it was really interesting to read Tolkien's exploration of what fairyland could look like. And in a way, very similar to The Great Divorce, he writes it as a place that is fundamentally good and yet dangerous. So, yeah, I think it's just a really interesting short story and check it out. Yeah, we have it in the edition, which is called Tales from the Perilous Realm. But I think they're sold individually as well. What I'm enjoying at the moment, I've said, I think I said about two years ago that I was very much enjoying the audiobook of Brideshead Revisited. And maybe I've mentioned watching the series before, but I've only ever actually watched the first episode, which I've watched about three or four, maybe five times. <laughs> we are finally watching the full series and it is amazing and glorious and lush and everything that you would want it to be. And perfect summer watching. <laughs> yeah, it's really beautiful. So I've been very much enjoying that. Um, and we did watch the first episode again because I just can't get over how much I enjoyed that first episode. It's like an hour and 40 minutes. It's a, like the rest of them are your usual kind of hour long, but the first one is an hour and 40 minutes. So you really have to put the time in, but it's a great episode episode. So that's what I've been enjoying. And maybe David, you can tell us how to find your podcast and all of the ways to reach out. Sure thing. Uh, our website is pintsforjack.com. Uh, we're also on Twitter and Instagram. And C.S. Lewis is probably one of the most misquoted men on the internet. Uh, this is a bane of my life when people you know, post on one of the groups, I love C.S. Lewis, he's my favorite author. This is my favorite quotation. And it's like, you have never looked that up, have you? Because he did not write that. <laughs> so what I try and do is post legitimate quotations with citations on Instagram. It is actually more fun than it sounds. And so, yes, so we're on pinesofjack.com, Twitter, Instagram, where's a Facebook page. And we are also on MySpace because we are bringing it back. 
Uh, Amazing. Yeah. Lots of my friends keep saying, oh, that's it. I'm quit quitting Facebook. It's like, fine, come back to MySpace. This is, <laughs> this is where it all began. Let's make it great again. Your your point about the misattributed quotes for Lewis, which I totally agree. There's so many times when I've seen it and I've just put my, my head in my hands. But the other one that I would like to say that I often do, and I, I, I don't actually know Audrey Hepburn's films that well, but I think she might be the queen of misattributed quotes on printed canvases in Home Depot stores. <laughs> um, they're usually on a vein of live, laugh, love. And I'm usually pretty confident that Audrey Hepburn has not, in fact, said those things. <laughs> So I, I even have a phrase of dubious Audrey Hepburn quotes. <laughs> uh, some people actually make a real cottage industry out of it. Uh, William O'Flaherty, he runs the All About Jack podcast, and he has an entire book of C.S. Lewis misquotations, uh, tracking down where they really came from. So uh, when we're talking about the great divorce and humility and pride, probably the number one quotation that you hear people quote of Lewis that isn't actually Lewis is something along the lines of humility isn't thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less, which at least is a Lewisian idea. That is what he thinks humility is. But it actually comes from Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life. <laughs> Slightly less lofty origins. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you so much for joining us and thanks everyone for listening. And uh, we look forward to being back again with you soon. Goodbye. Bye. This has been Risking Enchantment. Music by Kevin MacLeod. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter with the handle at Seeking Watson. And you can find out more about me and the podcast at rachelsherlock.com. Thank you and God bless. I hope you enjoyed that. And please join us again next time when we'll continue going further up and further in. Cheers.